So greetings. I'm Urta Tima Qurtubiya bin Abdel Karim al Hakam al Fasi. And by my name, you can see that I live in the great and glorious capital of Al Andalus, Qurtuba, which is known to the Franj as Cordoba. There is a bit of a, this is, as I say, a work in progress. I have a lot more research to do, but this, I think, represents some information worth passing along. Reconstructing Andalusi clothing presents a challenge because no garments survive from before 1492. And garments, although mentioned in texts, are not described in enough detail to reconstruct. Uh, for the Umayyad period and the first Taifa period which followed it, there are some relatively crude stone carvings on capitals of pillars and a large stone ablution basin, but everything is so stylized it's hard to distinguish the clothing. There are also some ceramics with people painted on them, but they are worn out from their years underground and again uh, hard to distinguish what people are wearing. There are, however, about 30 small, exquisitely carved ivory boxes and pyxides. A pyxis is a cylindrical box, and some of them have human figures on them. I have found nine of them with human figures, which begin to tell us a little bit about the clothing of the Umayyad period. Some scholars say that uh, because they are so stylized and the poses are so conventionalized that you can't really tell what people are wearing, but um, based on what I know about clothing around the Islamic world, I think that they do give us some useful information. But after the end of the first Taifa period, there's 200 years again with no pictorial examples that I've been able to find. Uh, perhaps there are some in the Christian corpus, which I haven't really looked at, which is why I need to continue studying. Then in the third Taifa period, there is the one and only single illustrated manuscript to survive from the glorious golden culture of Al-Andalus uh, in 800 years, because during the various wars, things were, libraries were destroyed, and also the Catholic bishops and priests decided that if it was written in Arabic, maybe it was a Quran, so it needed to be burned. So we have some texts that have survived, but this is the only illustrated manuscript then in the late 13th century, we have some manuscripts from the Spanish court of uh, Alfonso X, El Sabio, which provide pictures, but since they're painted by Spaniards and Christians, maybe they have some problems. So one must use them cautiously. Then finally, there's the great Nasrid period, the Nasrid dynasty, which ruled in Granada for about 250 years. They're the people who built the Alhambra, which is far more of amazing in real life than it is from any photographs. And it has wall and ceiling paintings, which present other problems because it looks like they were painted by Christian artists, maybe from Italy. Then after the fall of Granada in 1492, we move into the 16th century where we have some pictures of Andalusians, but they're painted by Christians and they have all been supposedly converted to Catholicism. So again, those present useful information and some problems. So here is a very brief history of Iberia, which is actually very complex, but I'm trying to put it in a nutshell. The Phoenicians sailed around the Mediterranean and established some trading settlements along the south coast of Iberia around 800 BCE. They founded the city of Carthage, and after Phoenicia, which was located in the Levant fell, the Carthaginians in North Africa, Carthage being in what is now Tunisia, uh, also established trading posts around the Mediterranean and more cities in, in uh, Iberia. But they were destroyed by the Romans, boo, boo Romans, who took the Iberian Peninsula around 150 BCE and named it the province of Hispania. Under Roman rule, a large number of Jews moved there and it was a safe place for them to live. Then after Rome fell and in 409, the Germanic Vandals crossed the Pyrenees and invaded Hispania, but they were kind of chaotic. And so about 150 years later, uh, 
the Byzantines established the province of Spania on the southwest coast and in the Balearic Islands, but also the Germanic Visigoths came over the Pyrenees and drove out the Vandals and eventually drove out the Byzantines, and they controlled the entire Iberian Peninsula, and they were not really very settled because there were multiple kingdoms in conflict with each other. The Visigoths would enslave other Christian Visigoths, and they, this constant conflict weakened it. And here's Visigoth Hispania with some of the different kingdoms and groups shown. But in 711, an army mostly made up of North Africans, known as Imazahen, or to us to other people as Berbers, uh, moved into Iberia and within a few decades had conquered all of uh, Iberia and had even crossed the Pyrenees and invaded southern Gaul. Uh, <clears throat> they were initially led by Tariq ibn Ziyad, who was Amazir, Berber, under the orders of Musa ibn Nuayr, who was an Umayyad Arab, the governor of Ifriqiya, the Umayyad province in North Africa. However, in 759, Narbonne was reconquered by Pepin the Short, the father of Charlemagne, so Iberia was the only area that was Islamic. They had conquered all the Visigoth kingdoms except one, the kingdom of Asturias in the far north. And by 716, the name Al-Andalus is first attested on coins minted by the new government. So this isn't just a name that Europeans made up much later, like Byzantium, which was made up in the 19th century as a name. They called themselves Al-Andalus. At that time, they were part of the Umayyad kingdom, and they were ruled from the city Kairawan in Tunisia. But in 750, the Abbasids murdered nearly all the Umayyads, and a few managed to escape to Kairawan. One surviving prince, Abd al-Rahman, established the Umayyad Emirate in Al-Andalus with his capital at Cortuba, known as Cordoba to the Frange, and his dynasty ruled until around 1031. The population of Al-Andalus at this time is estimated at 7 million people, which is quite a few, and it's a mix of religious and ethnic groups nearly equal parts Jewish, Muslim, Hispanic, uh, Gothic Christians, Imaziren, and a very small number of Arab elites. Abd al-Rahman treats the Dhimi fairly and includes Jews among his advisors. The Dhimi are the protected people of the book, so while they are not Muslims, they are generally monotheists who have received prophetic words from God, such as the Jews and the Christians, and in some other parts of the Islamic world, other people, as in Persia, the Zoroastrians, are included among the Dhimmi. While the Dhimmi have a lot of rights in an Islamic country, they also have restrictions on their lives, but they are not persecuted, or shouldn't be. The uh, clothing system at this point represents a mix of uh, Arabic clothing, such as sirwal, which are long straight-legged pants worn by both men and women, uh, the basic white linen under tunic, which is the kamis, and generally tunics cut on geometric shapes. Uh, so they're relatively simple to cut out and assemble and comfortable to wear. The imaziren bring the burnous for men, a relatively long hooded cloak, Another garment worn by both Arabs and Imaziren is the kisat, which is a huge length of woolen cloth, similar to the Amazir haik, and worn by both men and women. Uh, it is a wrap around the body, and there are many variations on the wrap. I have a photograph later from 1905, because none of the photographs from Al-Andalus have, have come to us. They also wore Spanish Christian garments, such as the saya, and not just the Christians wore it, but also the local uh, Muslims wore it. So the vestimentary system is a blend of these cultures. Here is three ways to write, wrap a kisa from 1905. Uh, this gentleman is putting it on. Here's one wrap, and there's how it's done. 
Here's an alternate version where he flings it over his shoulder so you can see how it is in the back. And here's a different version where it's kind of tucked in and wrapped around. This is just three ways. It's hardly definitive. There are uh, methods of wrapping it from almost every little town or region. But uh, so this would be a common garment worn by both men and women in some form or another. The Umayyads the, uh, managed to conquer almost the entire Iberian Peninsula, except for the Gothic Kingdom of Asturias, which managed to hold out in the far north. This ushered in a golden age of arts and culture. Uh, then in the ninth century, those nasty Abbasids began to fall apart in the Eastern, Islam Eastern Islamic region. And what had been an emirate, now the rulers of Al-Andalus felt confident to call themselves a caliphate. And Abd al-Rahman III, a direct descendant of the first Abd al-Rahman, took the title of caliph of the Western Islamic world. Uh, and as you can see from the map, they control nearly all of Iberia. Cordoba at this time, the capital city, has a population of about 450,000 people and was the most populous city in all of Europe at this time. There's a very small Arab elite, so when people talk about the Arabs in Al-Andalus, they're misunderstanding who was really there. In fact, one of the larger populations was the Muladi, who are ethnically Iberian, converted to Islam. There's also the Mozarabs, who are Christians, living in Al-Andalus who have accepted the culture, not the religion, and there are a large population of Jews. Multiple languages are spoken there. Arabic, of course, which is the classic language. Tamazight, which is the Berber language of North Africa. It's actually a family of languages. And Andalusi Romance, which has derived from Latin, which most of the populace spoke. It's also sometimes called Mozarabic, although this is a misnomer. And this is the language that Sephardic Jews have preserved to this day as Ladino. And there have been classes of people singing beautiful Ladino music as part of this program of classes on Iberia. This is the Umayyad Caliphate during the time of Abd al-Rahman III. As you can see, some inroads are being made by the Christians coming down mostly from the north. And then this is one holdout of uh, a little Islamic group that decided they didn't want to join the caliphate. And one reason I put maps up is over the course of time, the Christian areas get bigger and bigger and the Islamic area of Al-Andalus gets smaller and smaller. As I said before, there are limited sources of information on what clothing people wore. And uh, I was gonna put in the stone ablution basin so you could see how difficult it is to see what the hell is going on in it and some of those carved uh, stone capitals, but I decided I've got way too many slides already. Um, there are also textual sources with names of garments, but they know what they were wearing, so they never described it. Hi, everybody's wearing this garment, everybody knows what it looks like. So we are stuck for this time period, the late 10th and early 11th centuries with the ivory pixides and caskets. They are generally used to store jewelry or fragrant aromatic products, such as were spoken of in the last section, scented with musk, sandalwood, camphor, and oud, known as agarwood or aloes wood. As I said, there are 30 of them, and I'm not going to show you all of them because they don't all have people on them. And there are nine with people that I have been able to find, but I'm not going to show all of those either because it'll just take too long and some of them don't look terribly good. Uh, as the Christians reconquered the Iberian Peninsula and they came across these ivory caskets and pixides, they saved them and generally donate, donated them to churches and monasteries where they were used as reliquaries. As I mentioned, some scholars say the conventionalized poses don't really tell us how people looked, but again, from what I've seen of clothing in the rest of the Islamic world, what's on these boxes is pretty consonant with that. Um, However, it's almost all men. There's only one case that I have been able to find that shows women, and it's not a very good picture of women. Here's one scene from the Pixis of Al-Mukhira, who's the youngest son of Abd al-Rahman III. 
Um, this one is an especially beautiful little pixi pixis. Um, and here is a picture of three musicians in the court. This one is holding a fly whisk and a little container, probably for a beautifully scented product. Here's a musician playing an, an oud, and I'm not sure what he's holding here, possibly a fan. And if you look closely, you can see there's a placket on the front of these loose tunics. This is a distinguishing feature of this time period. Um, there's also what's possibly tiras on his sleeve and his sleeve. Uh, however, I think a lot of the time that tiras is shown in art, it's to cue the viewer to know that you're looking at people who are significant and not necessarily all the people wearing tiras in paintings would have worn them in real life. In this case, since these are courtiers, they probably are really wearing tiras. But again, note the plackets. Here we have some more court musicians from a different ivory pixis, again playing the oud, and here you can see he's got the placket in front, but now it's open. It's not fastened across his chest, but open so that it forms a little bit of a sense of a collar. And here's this lone panel that shows women. Here they are dancing wildly. Um, <clears throat> but the rest of the casket it's from is lost. However, there are traces of pigment on it, and it's possible that the other pixides and caskets were also painted. Um, the eyes of the people were inlaid, uh, the people and animals were inlaid with clear stone, possibly quartz, and uh, the red and green was on the foliage, blue on the flowers, green on the birds' tails. So this must have been quite dramatic to look at back when it was new. And here's a close-up of the central couple dancing. So you can see he's wearing a tunic, which is sashed at the waist. She's wearing a tunic, which is sashed at the waist, but her head is modestly covered by a scarf that wraps around her head and then is thrown over the shoulder. <clears throat> I am not certain that women would really have worn such short tunics. Certainly, if they were of the higher classes, they would not have. Um, but this is the only woman that we have in art between the 711 and the end of the 10th century. Oh, no, uh, the uh, 12th, the 13th century. So we have 500 years with no women. Sorry about that. Again, the caliphate, it's getting smaller and smaller, and the Christian kingdoms are getting larger. Here are names we know, Leon and Castile, Navarre, Barcelona, and I don't know, Ruby Gorsa, but it's going to disappear anyway. The Caliphate of Cordoba extends across the strait here into uh, what is now Morocco and the city of Tangier. And this is probably the most fabulous of the caskets and pixides I have found. This is the casket that is in Pamplona now. It was in a monastery in Laire, and it has 19 ivory plaques with 21 lobed medallions on them. Uh, the plaques were carved by a multitude of different artisans who in most cases actually signed their names somewhere hidden in the plaque. Um, there's a very long inscription around here that I'm not going to read to you, but it is, has been translated. Here again, we have the scene of some courtiers. He's holding a bottle with probably something fragrant in it, and he's holding a fly whisk. So it's a uh, piece of wood generally, sometimes maybe ivory, with horse hair on it to keep the bugs away. He's holding a stalk of something in his hands and possibly a pomegranate. Again, we have the placket on the front of the tunics. Uh, his is open. And we have what are probably tiras bands on the sleeves. The tunics are very ample and loose, as you can see from all the wrinkles and gathering on them. Here's another scene of musicians. Again, tiras bands and playing an oud, some sort of horn and some sort of flute. And here we have what is probably Caliph Hisham II, seated on a lion-supported throne with courtiers. Again, this one has a flag fan, a jar of scented perfume or oil, a fly, and a fly whisk. 
His placket is closed on the front of his garment. He probably really does have real Tiraz bands because Tiraz was the prerogative of the ruler who could give it to those he chose. And the attendants have their plackets open, forming this slight collar. Uh, I'm going to try and move more quickly through here, but again, the plackets. Even on elephants, plackets, this time the plackets are open. And making funny faces as they hunt down lions, uh, which may be a reference to the uh, Andalusians fighting with the uh, Kingdom of Leon. And here's Hawking. Uh, and again, he has the placket open long loose tunic on this one and a shorter tunic with pants on this one. And here's one of my favorites, which shows the placket very clearly on the front of the tunic uh, and an elaborate belt as he defeats lions. The inscription here is a blessing and it includes the name of the artisan who carved this particular panel. He has leg wraps and pant that uh, cover up the legs of his pants. And uh, while many of the other personages have been beardless, he has a beard, which may be significant. But the caliphate eventually fell apart. And we have the beginning of the first Taifa period with 33 independent Tawaif. Tawaif is the plural of Taifa. And <clears throat> What the Taifa are, are little independent emirates or principalities. Sometimes they're called kingdoms, but the people who ruled them weren't quite that powerful. They were often in conflict with each other. And of course, they were in conflict with the Christian Spanish who kept trying to reconquer them. The uh, Ta Tawaif is sometimes translated as party and they'll talk about the party kings. This doesn't mean that they were having good times celebrating. It just means they represented parties or factions. Um, it was a period of a lot of political chaos, war, the decline of Al-Andalus, but that didn't stop the intense intellectual and artistic activities because they different Tawaif competed with each other for the fineness of their arts, which is a shame that so much has been lost to us because clearly they were quite productive. Again, the, the Arabo-Mediterranean vestiment, vestimentary system continues to dominate uh, with the basic rectangular tunics, as we saw, sara, sawaril, which is the plural of sirwal, which are the long straight-legged pants, and loose outer wraps, such as the one that I demonstrated earlier. Uh, there continue to be regional, ethnic, and socioeconomic variations in the clothing, but these are not well documented. Usually, the people who are poor don't get talked about a lot. Uh, however, we do know that the burnous, the hooded cloak brought over from North Africa, continues to be a garment that is worn. It is mentioned in the texts. Uh, Pre-existing Punic and Byzantine influences continue such as the haik, which I sh can be wrapped around like I showed you in the photograph, but can also be worn like a Greek peplos or a Roman stola. And some of the tunica continue to have bands of decorative trim, which may reflect continuity from the Byzantine period. At the end of the first Taifa period in 1080, instead of 33, there are now only 11 independent Tawaif, and Leon has gotten very large. Because they were constantly fighting with the Christians, some of the leaders of the Tawaif contacted other groups of Imaziren in Morocco and said, help us, help us defeat the Christians. And that's when the Almoravids came in. They were a strict religious group and they had a kingdom in North Africa. They came into Al-Andalus and they stayed. They did not go home. Uh, so those, those little kings of the Tawaif uh, may have been a little bit disappointed to find out that they were no longer in control. The uh, 
the Almoravid men wore a face veil, the litham, and no one else was allowed to wear it but them. Women did not even veil their faces. Only the men did who were Almoravid. If you tried to curry favor as a man with the Almoravid rulers and you put on a face veil, you risked arrest or death. The women, however, uh, began to cover their hair more because traditionally in Al-Andalus, women were very free to travel around. They did not cover their faces, although they may or may not have covered their hair. Um, but eventually the Almoravids succumbed to the charms of Al-Andalus and gave into the Andalusi way, which included drinking wine as well as making beautiful art and enjoying themselves. However, because they are so far away from their central base down here in Waga, Wadagost, uh, eventually they were fighting wars back in North Africa and they became weak. And this led to another period of uh, Tawaif. So we have the second Taifa period. Now we have 22 Tawaif. Leon has merged with Castile and has gotten bigger, but we have a lot of great cities still remaining in Al-Andalus. And again, although they are competing with each other, uh, fighting wars, uh, the Emirates of the Tawaif are still also vying for cultural prestige and producing uh, architecture, music, poetry, and art. But the Christians kept advancing, and so the leaders of the Tawaif asked for more help from North Africa again. They didn't seem to remember what happened last time. This time, <clears throat> they, <clears throat> they contacted the Almohads. The Almohads made the Almoravids look like slackers. They were a militant religious movement founded by Ibn Tumart, who had messianic claims. He was the next coming prophet after Muhammad. And his tribes in uh, uh, Morocco uh, first established their region over the Atlas Mountains. Then they took over Morocco and what is part of Algeria here. And uh, then they moved into Al-Andalus. They moved the capital from Cordoba to Seville, known to the Muslims as Ishbilia. Uh, now things were much stricter. Women had to cover themselves more out in public. The uh, Almohads were not very forgiving if you broke the rules. And they did something that is unusual, although we've seen a bit of that in these recent days in this century. They abolished the status, the protected status of Dimi. Anyone who was Christian or Jewish was forced to convert or they would kill them. And many who did not want to convert fled often to the Christian Iberian states, which was not so bad for the Christians, but not necessarily very good for the Jews. Those who stayed and converted to Islam were not trusted and assumed to be pretending that they had, were converts. And so the Almohads established the wearing of distinguishing and humiliating clothing for the Jews. They had to wear uh, blue-black garments in public, no colors, and they had to wear a strange hat on their head that was shaped like a pack saddle, which extended below the ears. Um, I don't have a picture of it, but it is described in the some surviving texts. Al-Mansur, who was the ruler at that time, said, if I were sure of the sincerity of their Islam, I would let them mix with the Muslims. And if I were sure of their unbelief, I would kill the men, enslave the children, and declare their property spoils for the Muslims. But I'm not sure. So they continued to humiliate them. Eventually, they fell apart too, because their home base was back in North Africa, and we move into the third Taifa period. There are now 10 Tawaif, plus the city-state of Granada, and Al Pujara, which is near Granada, which may be a Tawaif, which may be a Taifa, or it may be uh, considered a separate city state. It's a mountainous area that's a little hard to get to. We haven't seen any clothing because 
Nothing has survived to show us the clothing. There is, however, this one work that has survived from this period, from probably the second quarter of the 13th century, which is the Hadith or Kisat of Bayad wa Riyad, the story of Bayad and Riyad, which is one of those love stories. The book, however, doesn't survive in its entirety. Some of the last pages are missing, and we don't know if Bayad and Riyad got together or not. However, from so many other Arabic tales, they are of unrequited love, so that's what I suspect. In the art, you will see that there is a variety of turbans being worn. There are large rounded ones. There are oval ones, and there are sort of average sized ones with a long tail hanging in the back, and there are turbans wound around a pointed cap, which is probably a kawansuwa, and all the turbans in the art show gilded tiraz bands. However, after the Almohads, turbans fell out of favor in Al-Andalus, so this is sort of a, a transitional period of art here. The only people who wore the turban were important uh, rulers of clans, paddies who are judges, scholars, and the leaders of the militia. At this time, colored garments were popular. The wealthy wore silk, often which woven patterns in them in multiple colors. And the clothing of the nearby kingdom, Christian kingdoms continued to influence the dress. So again, they were still wearing the shaya, the Spanish saya. It was not only worn by peasants, but even the Nasrid monarch would wear it because it was comfortable when he went out riding. There is a sleeved garment called maluta or marlota in Spanish, whose precise details are vague. It is mentioned that it has sleeves, and other than that, we don't really know much about it at this time. And the hooded cloak, which is shorter than the burnous, comes across. It's called a cabilar in Arabic or in Spanish, a capellar. So this is shorter than a burnous, but still has a hood, which is convenient. And here we have some pictures from Bayad and Riyadh. This, as I said, is the only surviving work of art, illuminated stories. And it is in the Vatican who, instead of destroying everything, snuck away a lot of fine pieces of art to their collection. Here we have Bayad in his giant bulbous turban with its tiraz band, playing the oud. He is in a garden that belongs to this very important woman who is called the Lady. She is not given a name. And these are her women here. And here is a servant in the back bringing a beverage. It could be wine, it could be sharbat. So they all have their cups and they're listening attentively as he's a visitor from Syria. Notice we still have decorative bands on the sleeves, on the cuffs, and around the neckline. You can see that the garments are very loose and drapey, nothing is tight or form-fitting, and as I showed you before, there are a variety of different sorts of drapes that men and women wear, and so this is not a skirt, but a drape put modestly over her legs. This woman is also having a modest drape over her legs. So Bayad has fallen in love with Riyadh, who is one of the maidens attending the lady, and here we have a go-between bringing a letter to Bayad, who sits here waiting patiently. She has another one of those drapes over her head, and she's pulled it up over her, partially over her face for modesty. But you can still see things are loose. He's got trim here, um, and there's the little decorative band on his turban. And Bayad has swooned. He's fallen down out of the pain of love, his turban is still round, but you can see the long tail that would have been hanging down in the back with decorative trim. There's decorative trim around the wrists of his tunic. And this is um, a relative of the people he's, who have been helping him. And he's standing here again, trim on the sleeve, on the cuff, on the neck, on the, on the turban. And again, he has a garment draped over his shoulder and partially wound himself uh, which is very, very typical throughout the region and even today in parts of Morocco, people still uh, wear drapes, both men and women. Once again, Bayad is getting another letter. Here's the go-between, handing a letter to him. Several women are sitting by who care about him. 
Uh, no, no band on the sleeves here, but around the neck and the wrists. And here's something that I didn't point out in the earlier pictures. This little curl over the cheek is very typical in the art of this period. There are some uh, bits of ceramic that are incomplete, but do show women's faces. And again, they're wearing this little curl. And I don't know about this time period, but I know in other parts of the Islamic world, a gel is made from quince seeds that can hold the hair in place. So that may be what they're using here. We're near the end of the book. Here is, pardon the bad quality of this picture, here is Riyadh begging forgiveness of the lady. Again, she's got a drape. The go-between is wearing a drape. The young women of the court have the curls. And one thing I didn't measure mention is this headdress that the lady has on in all the pictures. This is probably a Taj. This is quite unlike the Taj that is known in Persia, but consistent with some other headwear that survives in North Africa. It's made of metal. This is probably just a front and not a full dome over her head. And then it probably goes back around the back with a band, somewhat like a, a crown or a, or a coronet. And this is elaborately chased uh, with uh, patterns in it. And it also helps to indicate her high status. And we don't know how the story ends. Do Bayad and Riyadh get together or are they forever separated and heartbroken? I don't know. Why do I have this garment here, which belonged to Bishop Dorada? It was what he was buried in. And that is because rumor has it that the burial garments he was found in or that he was put away in were gifts from uh, Al-Andalus. This is his innermost tunic. It's made of linen. And I don't know if it looks anything like the tunics worn by the Muslims, but you can see that it has a relatively straight sleeve, slightly tapered here. There's a seam here under the arm. Uh, it's incredibly wide because here's where his shoulders would be. So lots of fabric, loose and comfy. I'm not sure if this is purely Spanish or perhaps influenced by the Arabs, but this garment definitely has, is made of Andalusi fabric. I've sketched it over here so you can see where the seam lines are. The trim on the cuffs, over the shoulders, somewhat reminiscent of the Byzantine tunics, the trim at the bottom, um, definitely Andalusi. This one has a Kufic inscription in it, and even this fabric, which you can't see here, is woven in a pattern. It's not just plain white. This is luxurious silk. This is as close as I've been able to find Andalusian garments until the end of Al-Andalus. This is put on over the top of the garment in the previous slide, so he's wearing three layers. This is much more like the Arabic garments, or the Muslim garments, I mean to say. Very loose and wide, commodious, made with inscribed uh, woven fabrics. Uh, and again, the background fabric here also has a pattern woven into it. And I've uh, simplified this here again so you can see the seam lines. This one is even simpler than the previous garment, made of fewer pieces. Again, as close as we can get to what they were wearing. And at the end of the 13th century, we have the reign of Alfonso X, known as El Sabio the Wise, who is the king of Castile and Leon and Galicia. He had a fairly long reign. He lived nearly all the century. However, there are some complexities to it that I won't get into because history just takes too long. It's amazing how complex things were. He did foster a very cosmopolitan court. He encouraged learning. He had Christians, Muslims, and Jews in his court. Uh, they were especially active translating works from Latin and Arabic into Castilian. This is really revolutionary. The use of the vernacular suddenly takes works out of the realm of only the most educated or foreigners and encourages other people to learn to read their own language and the development of sciences, literature, philosophy, and law in Spain. He also sponsored the works of historians who for the first time placed Spain in the context of world history, not just 
the blinkered view of your own area and your neighbor, but the whole world. Because of his scientific interests, he was nicknamed Astrologo, the astrologer. Um, don't let that fool you. At this time, both astronomy and astrology were closely linked together, and astrology was also connected with um, concerns about health. So this is a very broad subject. He was also an author of poetry and is attributed with writing the Cantigas de Santa Maria, which survive in two manuscripts, although one of them has been split into two pieces. They have illustrations. They have Christian women. Um, I don't remember seeing any Muslim women in them. Um, and they may be a bit stylized in their art. So I'm not sure how true they are to reality. He also had his famous books of games written, and they were translated into Castilian from Arabic with illustrations added to make the work easier to understand. It was completed in 1283, and this is a major source of clothing information, although once again, uh, it's hard to know how stylized it is. This is from Codex E in the Escorial of the Cantigas de Santa Maria. It shows two Andalusian musicians. Chances are good. This is not real tiras, but just decorative trim imitating tiras. Again, trim around the neck, trim around the cuffs, um, big loose tunics. He's wearing the Spanish hat known as a capillero. So even though he's dressed like a Muslim, he's wearing a Spanish hat. She's dressed like a Muslim and has a band around her head and a drape over her head and shoulder. It's also important that she's playing an hourglass drum because this is one of the few pictures of an hourglass drum. Uh, there's debates about whether the Dumbek or Darabuka is SCA period. I say this kind of indicates that it is. Okay. Here we have two more. You're coming movies. up to the, your mark for questions. Okay, um, I'm getting close to done. Uh, so here we have two more musicians. This one is wearing a typical Arabic tunic, as we saw in other places, but he's wearing the Spanish peyote over his tunic. He's barefoot, bare-legged. This one is dressed like a Christian in a saya and cordada, and he's wearing the capillo on his head. Now we get to <clears throat> the other codex, which is called Codex T, and split in half. The other half is known as Codex F, but I've kind of merged them together. And again, we have the same sort of <clears throat> Islamic garment here, the loose tunic with trim at wrists, neck, and on the sleeves. The turbans here are a little different. They're kind of weird and pointy. I don't know how accurate that is or if that's just an artistic convention. Again, we have them in their outfits, and here we have Spanish court, the capillo. He's wearing, it looks like, a peyote, a cloak over, a mantle over his shoulders. We have Muslim warriors along with prisoners of war. The prisoners of war are interesting because these are Spanish Christians wearing the saya. These are Sub-Saharan Africans also wearing what appears to be the saya. And we have Muslims who are also prisoners wearing what's possibly the saya. The, some of the Christians are wearing hose or stockings on their legs, but some of the other people are wearing leg wraps. Leg wraps are not uncommon. Um, both men and women wore them. He is clearly the leader in the most elaborate robe. This is one of the few robes I've seen that shows patterning on the robe. Sometimes this was woven in, could be embroidered, and it's even possible that they were bits of gold decoration that was applied to the cloth. And a bit more of the same. Now we get to the books of games. Here we have three men. He's wearing his turban wrapped around this pointy hat, which is a kalansua. He's barefoot. He's wearing those little pointy black slippers. This man has taken off his kalansua and it's sitting here while he's consulting this text. And here's an extant kalansua. This uh, was made in Syria and found in Egypt. It maintains its shape because it has bits of reed here quilted into the fabric to hold the point up. 
Now we have three women playing games. These are three Muslim women. Again, the commodious loose tunics on these two. Uh, she's got a sheer drape over her head, held in place by a headband, which could be embroidered, could be a strip of woven cloth, perhaps. And tablet, woving, tablet weaving was known at this time. This could be tablet woven. She has a heavy opaque drape over her head, also held in place here. She has henna on her hands, and she has henna on her hands. She, however, is in her underwear, because that is what people often did if you were at home. You wear your underwear. The cloth was very sheer. Um, cotton and linens were spun really fine and woven really, really well to be sheer like this. Nowadays, they only achieve that by uh, weaving them loosely, and it's not really proper. It's hard to find good sheer linen or cotton. Here is the drawstring on her sirwal. This is known as a tikka, and if you uh, were flirting with a lover, you might give, uh, as a woman, you might give the man the drawstring from uh, the tikka from one of your pair of sirwal. That was very sexy. What is distinctive here is she has embroidery on her shoulders. There is embroidery on the shoulders of other garments like this in other pictures. This is probably a rilala, which was made of sheer fabric and has a little tie at the neck. So in uh, some of the other pictures, it's untied and you can see the strings hanging down. Um, this little cap on her head is, hang on, I'm almost there. It's a lifafa. This is probably like a scarf that's folded in half and then tied under her hair in the back. It's probably embroidered, although I suppose it could be made of woven decorated fabric. And down here are shoes. These are possibly the kind that are known as puk because they're made out of cork. Otherwise, the women are wearing those little pointy black slippers that are kind of like ballet slippers with pointed toes, not curly toes, just pointed toes. And this shows how sheer clothing was worn indoors. We have two men playing chess, accompanied by a harper and two serving women bringing uh, food and beverages. Uh, again, these look sub-Saharan African. She isn't quite so dark, so we have mixed ethnicities, which was very common in Al-Andalus. And she's wearing completely sheer uh, hamis or gilala, and sheer sirwal, as he is, and he also has a drape over his shoulder. These two men have kawansuwa, and they're all relaxed at home. And I'm sorry, this is so blurry, I don't have a better picture, but it shows a Christian playing chess with a Muslim. Here's those little slipper shoes. Again, the loose tunic. This is a burnous because it's quite long. And this is probably a tailasan that he has draped over his head and over his head wrap. But all of Al-Andalus was conquered by the Spanish at the end of the third Taifa period, except for the Nasrid Emirate of Granada, which survived for 250 years without being conquered because they made arrangements with the Christians around them and the Christians uh, followed through with those arrangements until Ferdy and Izzy showed up. Okay. We're at the five minute mark for those that need to change rooms. And the two questions right now that I see in the chat room are, do the women have black dots on their chins or are they artifacts of the image? And do you have any idea what patterns were on the same colored fabric? I'm assuming that's the weaving pattern. Um, there are some close-up photographs of Bishop Dorada's tunics so that you can see the uh, damask weaving on them. Um, I didn't include it because I had so much other stuff in here. As far as, as far as the black dots on someone's face, I haven't noticed them as being a, a definite thing. I think it's just an artifact of the photographs. So now we're almost at the end here and there's a new garment adopted by the Nasrids from the Spanish called the Garnacha, which is seen in multiple places on the ceiling paintings in the Hall of Kings in the Alhambra. Uh, there are Christian women portrayed on two of the side ceilings, but I haven't seen any women 
any Nasrid Muslim women, and the paintings are identified as in an Italian style. So this may have been painted by a Muslim or, uh, I'm sorry, by a Christian Spaniard or an Italian. This is the central dome of the Hall of Kings. Uh, we don't know that they're really kings, but they're certainly important people, although they're not identified, so we don't really know who they are. Here's a close-up. This man is wearing the garnacha. It's a pullover garment with loose sleeves. Uh, there's a bit of a curve here. Sometimes the side seam isn't shown. Uh, the underarm seam is not sewn at all. These men are wearing your basic loose tunics. <clears throat> he has a hood, which may be a tailasan, and they're wearing what are probably cuff boots made of soft leather, and they're carrying the distinctive Nasrid sword known as a hineta. Here are three more of the nobles. This one is wearing the garnacha, as you can see the curved arm seam, uh, the curved arm edge here, and again, no seam. This one is wearing a party colored garment, and there are three or four party colored garments on this uh, ceiling. The ceiling was uh, covered with leather, glued on, and then this was painted and gilded on the leather. This is from one of the side scenes. A Muslim knight is killing a boar, and he is wearing the garnacha. Here you can see how loose those floaty sleeves are. He has a hood, which may be a tailasan, and his tunic underneath. And in 1492, we have a problem. The Nazareds decide to stop paying tribute to the Spanish rulers, and Ferdi and Izzy, especially Izzy from what I hear, was having none of it, so they attacked Granada. They spent a lot of money hiring mercenaries who finally defeated the city-state in 1492. In March, they issued the Edict of Expulsion, declaring that all Jews must be driven out of the kingdom and all its territories, and in July of that year, they put it into effect. At that time, almost a half a million Jews were living in Spain. Um, that's a lot of people to expel, and most of them did flee the country. Um, most of them went to North Africa, to Italy, or to the Ottoman Empire. Some accepted the forced conversion to Catholicism, but they were never trusted and uh, were called Maranos. And even in the 20th century in Spain, people remembered their family names and still discriminated against them. Uh, there has been, uh, uh, the Spanish government has finally made peace with that and accepted the uh, Maranos and Conversos as real Spaniards. Um, that only took 500 years. The Spanish Inquisition also killed many of the Jews who refused to convert. Known as the Sephardim, um, they remain today having fled and preserving uh, a different form of Judaism and some beautiful music. And some of the conversos went to Spanish colonies and some people only discovered recently that they had converso Jewish families with the genetic tests that people do now. Here's a map showing where they fled the red lines show uh, what happened in the 15th and 16th centuries. Ignore the black lines, they're out of period. So what happens? Men continue to wear the saya. Women continue to, continue to wear Andalusi Islamic clothing. We have two main sources for this, which are the relief carvings in the Cathedral of Granada from the second quarter of the 16th century, and we have the Trachtenbuch of Christoph Weiditz, from around 1530. Here's one of the carvings from the cathedral. It shows Boabdil, the ruler of the Nasrid Granada, giving the keys to the conquering Spanish. He's holding a typical um, Andalusi shield, and over here are men with their hands bound in lines. You can see they're wearing a short tunic, probably the saya, and you can see their long straight-legged pants as the Sir Wall had long straight legs. This is the conversion of the men. Again, they're wearing saya, uh, leggings or hose, and uh, they m many of them have bare heads, and they are being converted. Here are the women being converted. They are still covering themselves modestly. 
with a cloth that covers their head and most of their body. Again, this is like the haik or the kisa, and they're wearing uh, long tunics and some sort of a hat on their head. They look very sad. This is from the Trachtenbuch of Christoph Weiditz. Uh, it shows Moorish dancers, three men in saya, bare legs now, uh, sad sandals perhaps made of esparto grass, and here's a woman in a very distinctive outfit, which is common to this period now. She has uh, leggings over her legs, obviously, which have these horizontal pleats or wrinkles. She's got this sleeveless or very short sleeved coat. And then she has a party colored coat underneath it. Here's another picture of the woman in the outfit. Oh, sorry. Oh, my computer is falling down. We're almost done. I think I have like two more pictures. And she has this cloth on her head, which is opaque. It's called a sabania. This is a, holding it in place. It's called a rolete or rodete. She's wearing a white camis inside, which is now different than those long tunics. Now it's a short tunic that's open in the front. Uh, the garment with sleeves is identified as a marlota, but we're not seeing much of it. Hers appears to be party colored, but somehow the sleeves don't match the hem. And this over it, which is sleeveless and buttons up the front, is called an atabe. Um, they, uh, I don't remember if I put a picture in here of the almalafa, which is a loose drape that covers the whole head and body. It's pleated and has a tie, and it's uh, even Spanish women wore it. He is still wearing the saya, and he's wearing possibly patents or possibly sandals on a uh, cork sandals on his feet. This has been expurgated. She was naked here, and here's her open kameez. You get a better view of the leggings and the sirwal, which may not be as large as they look because I've tucked pants into boots and they poofed out even when they were almost skin tight. And here is Mistress Violante de Saint Sebastian from the Kingdom of Atlantia in her outfit that she made like the Trachtenbuch outlet outfit. But even though the Moors were not forcibly converted like the Jews, they were still not really welcome. And eventually an order of expulsion was written by Philip the, Philip the Third in 1609, saying that all the Moors had to leave. Um, even though they had converted some of them, Moriscos were converted Muslims, um, converted to Catholicism. And there was a whole period where various flotilla of Muslims sailed across the Mediterranean to North Africa, where they continue in some cases to identify themselves as Andalusi. One thing that happened was driving out all these Moriscos, who many of whom were uh, agricultural workers, meant that several kingdoms fell into complete economic despair because they had driven out all their workers. <laughs> a third of the population had been driven out and um, the economy went to hell. Um, so that is what I have here. And I can take any other questions if there are anybody left. Okay. Um Someone was going to ask about the leggings, but I think that last slide sort of showed how they were done. Um, yeah, they're, they're long, longer than the legs and then pleated to give that special look. Yeah, she says that answered her question. Okay. Uh, thank you for everyone. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now. And if you have any other things, everything else will be posted later on as we convert the videos and the slides and everything else. Uh, you can do SCA Iberia at westkingdom.org or request for um, handouts and slides from the teachers. I think I got the email right. It's in the chat room.
Uh, just check back on Facebook and the website so you can find all this information. Um, someone goes, were the plackets on the early tunics likely to be different than the rest of the tunic? Um, there's no way to tell for sure because none of those uh, ivories have any paint on them uh, at this point. I suspect it's the same. However, if you were of a higher status, they might have been made out of luxury fabric. I've been meaning to experiment with it. I got some fabric from Sartor, which is a reproduction of an Andalusi fabric that I've been meaning to make the placket out of. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is that most of those outer garments people are wearing are wool. Soft wool. It's the outer garments are not cotton or linen. Yeah, uh, uh, someone they, else asked, are the tree bands attached to the garment or are they separate bands? And what um, were the pieces at the necklines of some of the men in the later images, sort of the tab shaped? Um, those look to me like there's something holding on a coif uh, over their head. Um, if you're talking about the men on the uh, Hall of Kings, um, as far as the tiras, uh, what was the question about the tiras again? Um, are they attached to the garment or are they separate bands? I'm assuming um, I, uh, woven into the garment or are they separate and attached? Um, as far as I can tell, based on the way the paintings look to me, and also the extant garments from Bishop Dorada, they are sewn on. They're woven separately and then sewn on. Okay, and uh, when they wore three layers, linen slash cotton, silk, and wool. Um, that's a question? Yeah, that's the question. I guess which layer was what? Was it well, cotton and the linen, then silk, then wool? wool? The outer layer was likely to be wool. If you were really rich, the outer layer might be silk. If you're wearing two tunics and you're rich, maybe your inner tunic is also silk. However, the garment next to the skin, the chemise, is always either linen or cotton because they are easy to keep clean. You can wash them when you can't wash the silk. And uh, both cotton and linen were grown there. Cotton wasn't there originally, but by the 10th century, the Andalusi were growing cotton. They were also growing weiss. They brought a whole lot of uh, vegetables and other things with them to expand agriculture. Okay, so, and thank you very much. I'm going to end the recording. All right. Thank you.